you should get a little notification. So if you're okay with the session being recorded again, we just use this for our record keeping and also to share with people who might have missed the opportunity to give them the most up-to-date content. I do want to take a second um, to get to know all of you guys and to have you all get to know us. Um, my name is Brandon White. I think I did almost all of your, if not all of your volunteer orientations this session. Um, but if you haven't met me before, I am the Director of Education here at NICE. Um, so I oversee all youth and adult activities and initiatives um, and do a lot of leadership um, efforts across the whole state when it comes to education for this particular population that we serve. Um, I will tell you guys, um, we have a brand new volunteer and training coordinator who is assisting tonight and getting to learn the ropes of the position, um, Elizabeth Harrington, who's been working with us over the summer in our youth education program and is super excited, I'm sure, um, to be working in this role as well. Elizabeth, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I think you did a pretty good job, but I'm Elizabeth Harrington and I'm the new volunteer and training coordinator. Um, I came from working with our youth students in the summer camp program this summer and just couldn't get enough. So um, I'm back here now to um, work with you all and I can't wait to get started. Thanks, Elizabeth. We're really excited about that too. Uh, so um, I will say right now, because we're in transition with volunteer coordinators, the best way to get in touch with the team is through that volunteer at empowernashville.org email address, because we're going to have several folks in there helping to monitor incoming emails. If you email me directly or Elizabeth directly, you might not get a response as quickly. Um, so that is what we want you to do for the time being. Um, again, why are we uh, recording this? I kind of let you know that already. Um, let's dig into our population. As we mentioned last time, um, you know, there is a difference between refugees, asylees, and immigrants. Adult education is one of the only programs at NICE where we serve all of these groups. Um, so you might have someone who lived in Egypt or is from Egypt originally, who has a college degree from their home country and has worked their whole life and decided on their own to move to the United States and just wants to learn English. Um, you might have someone who's been here. I had one this morning a student who's been in the country for 12 months, who knows zero English and is you know, struggling to adapt um, through that refugee pipeline. So um, we have a healthy mix, I will say, of all these groups, which is good because we rely on our strong students to help mentor those who are just learning. Uh, I am gonna tell you guys a little bit about the program and structure, but before I go into this any further, I wanna learn about all of you all. So. Um, it's a small group. I'm just going to go around to ask that you introduce yourself, um, a little bit about who you are. It's great. Maybe where you're from, um, why you're interested in volunteering at NICE, and if you want, what you do for a living. Uh, I'm going to toss to Bobby first. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, my name is Bobby Brown, and uh, I just moved back to the Nashville area earlier this year. My wife and I and our four kids were living in Taiwan. Um, and we, we work for, uh, we actually work for a, like a international missions organization, but we, we work from here in Tennessee. Um, and we've just been spending a lot of time kind of diving into the refugee world here. Um, I've been working a little bit with Chris doing like apartment setups and um, yeah, we're just kind of something we're kind of, a passion is growing inside of us. Um, and I historically have been a teacher, both in schools and uh, churches and all kinds of different areas. And I just think this is an area where I'll be able to help and also just really enjoy. And I think just be able to, I think just use how I feel that I'm gifted, you know? Um, so yeah, so I'm excited. Awesome. Well, it's really exciting to hear that you have that experience with Chris's team. And if you guys haven't done an apartment setup, it's it's kind of, it's direct client services, but you do it before they even get here. And it's kind of fun to set the stage and make a home for someone that they're gonna live in um, foreseeably for quite a while and before they even get to see it. So that's a really neat way to volunteer as well. Um, let's hear from David. All right, my name is David Weir, I'm retired. And uh, my career was as a clinical chemist toxicologist but my first degree was in English and speech, which was my first love, especially linguistics. 
And uh, then last year, when we received that check from the government, I thought, I need to do something useful with this. I decided to go ahead and get my uh, TESOL certification. And I did that. I had been doing volunteer work for about 10 years. So I did that. And I'm really excited to get back into teaching. I've loved it. Homeschooled the kids. It's a medical education. Love teaching, especially with the entry level individuals who know no English or the older English or older individuals who have special challenges. So I'm looking forward to working in your program to be of some assistance in that area. That's awesome to hear, David. And we definitely do have that specific audience. We have a lot of older individuals who come in with very little language skills and it often takes them quite a while to really adjust. As a matter of fact, Brandon, one of my goals was to try to set up a program to target not the initial younger immigrants, but their parents who are becoming over later to begin a, a, some type of program with them in their home country before they come here. So that when they come here, they're able to ride the bus or get the social security check, just basic things like that. That's one of my ultimate goals. Yeah, that's a really awesome goal, David. We should talk a little more about that because that's something that I'm working on as well as connecting back to some of the camps Great. that we resettle from. Um, I will also tell you that we have a new grant coming to us from Weston Foundation, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, that targets the elder community in particular for adult education services. And so we'll have hopefully even more folks from that older audience uh, joining our program. But we do have several people who are in the 65, 75 plus category with just very minimal language skills. They're always exactly. in an intro or literacy class and they're learning um, phonemic awareness for the first time, letter sound yeah. recognition. And so. I thought being a, a, a member of that community myself would be a bridge to that to give, give me an advantage. Yeah, that's really exciting. Um, well, thank you so much for introducing for yourselves. Um, just so everybody knows, TESOL, by the way, is teaching English as a second language certificate. Um, and there is there are several programs in our area that offer that certificate. Um, and yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to get. Um, it does require some teaching hours and lots of other things. But uh, yeah, that's that's a neat accomplishment, David. Thanks for sharing. Let's go to Nagar. Uh, thank you, Brandon. My name is Nagar. I'm originally from Iran, Kurdistan. We moved here 2014, not exactly as an immigrant. We came here with J visa, mm. and then we changed our status. We're a, we're a refugee right now. We were asylum seeker, and we got granted. So we've been living here for almost seven years. I lived in Nashville before. We moved to Amherst to finish school. I just finished my master in art education. I came here myself with not speaking English at all. I was the one who attended some of these English classes that you offer now. And I'm so excited to be able to help uh, more people that they, I was in the same situation with them. And I am fluent in Persian and Kurdish as I mentioned before, I guess. And I believe, you know, when you know more than one language, we kind of, know the connection and you know how to teach it. Uh, so I work as a para in Amherst and also art teacher. Uh, so we moved back to Nashville almost one month ago, very new. Uh, I'm, I live with my two kids and I'm so excited to be able to help and do something. That is awesome. Well, we are really excited that you chose us to help and do something for, yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, let's see, Zinia, do you want to go next? Yes, and I apologize in advance that my phone is shaky. I'm in a car driving back to Nashville. We were just visiting my family in Wisconsin, so um, bear with me here. Yeah, so um, I originally came to the States when I was four years old uh, from Russia. And that's kind of what got me interested in linguistics and ESL. Um, I went to school for professional writing and got a minor in linguistics and TESOL and did some practicum teaching, nothing too serious. Um, but I actually worked with two Saudi Arabian women uh, during the last year of my college education. And that was a lot of fun. I uh, moved to Nashville about five, six months ago. 
and just thought that I missed teaching and that I wanted to go back to it. So I found you guys just by a Google search and I'm really excited to volunteer. That's awesome. I will definitely uh, let Google know that we owe them big for that. <laughs> um, we actually have a great partnership with Google uh, Applied Digital Skills Program, and we use it all the time for workforce development. So that's a really neat story. Thank you for sharing and welcome to the team. Thank um, you. Nikita, would you mind introducing yourself? Are you available to come off mute? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikita Lasur. And I'm currently a business analyst. Um, I just want to, to um, be an adult tutor um, just because I just think that it's really important that if you are don't normally speak English, that you're still able to be, you know, a citizen of the country and be able to communicate with everyone to get a job and not have any issues when it comes with that because there are a lot of things that prevent you from, you know, feeling comfortable, especially speaking a different language. So that's really the reason why I want to volunteer with you all. And I'm just really excited about this because I've been looking for an organization to join um, since I've been here. And I'm from originally from Memphis, but I've lived in Nashville for about 10 years because I went to college here. So it's nice to meet you all. Oh, how cool. Well, it is nice to meet you too, Nikita. Um, thank you for introducing yourself. Lynn, do you wanna go next? Hi, um, my name is Lynn. So something is wrong with my camera. I apologize for that. Um, and the other thing I want to I want to tell you right away is that I've already committed to work for a smaller organization in the fall, but I thought I would join this session anyway to find out more what NICE is about, not NICE is about, and um, and how you manage your programs. Um, I'm a, a lawyer, a corporate lawyer. I retired a couple of years ago, and. Um, during COVID, I, like many other people, um, thought a lot about what on earth we're, we're doing <laughs> with our lives. And um, I realized um, um, how small my world was in, in so many ways. And um, one of the things that um, attracted me about ESL is that both of my grandparents were immigrants. and um, it was hard for them, but people helped them. And it occurred to me that this would be something I could do. Um, I was able to get an online certification during COVID. Um, I'm a CELTA certified um, teacher with no experience <laughs> other, than the, um, other than the student teaching that we did online during COVID. And, um, I am, uh, I've always been attracted to teaching. Uh, I also have done a lot of work in, in ethics and did a lot of training of um, employee populations on ethics rules and um, enjoyed it very much and um, enjoyed my student teaching very much. So I'm looking forward to, um, to helping uh, immigrants and refugees in, in the Nashville area very much. Awesome. Well, we're glad that you still chose to join us for this evening, Lynn. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to spend just a few minutes going over um, our program and the structure and some of the ins and outs here. So, um, you know, a lot of this I will say is in flux. I'm going to kind of make corrections as we go. Um, but this is the gist of everything here. So our adult ESL classes are nine weeks. We have both morning and evening options. Um, and usually the, the way this works is that the Tuesday, Thursday is actually when classes are held. So when you're working from the book and there are lesson plans available to you, um, Wednesdays are community day and community day is a time where the entire center, um, whether it be, you know, all the students inside of a school or all the students at a community center or in a particular library, wherever the class may be held, um, we'll come together and do an activity together, mixed group. So it's low and high students together. 
And these are all practical life skills that tie back into community resources. So for example, we've done one where we'll have everyone pull out their license and fill out a paperwork form for the doctor's office, for example, and we'll help them connect the information from their license and their insurance card to what's on the paperwork. Um, we might have the public library come in and teach them about their special section, New American Corner. Um, we've uh, uh, National Public Television is uh, slotted to come and talk about how to make TV time educational and what programs they offer. Um, there's just a myriad of partners I could go on all day about. I won't. <laughs> um, sometimes we talk about uh, employment partners. Sometimes we talk about community resources, government subsidies. SNAP will come in and talk about application processes. Just the list goes on and on. Um, the curriculum that we use hits specific content areas that are important to your daily life and work. And we try to work partners in that align to our curriculum throughout the year. Um, two of our morning sites right now are Woodmont Hills and Donaldson Fellowship. These are both churches that have access to large classrooms um, that have been gracious enough to donate those spaces to us. Um, so this is in the Berry Hill neighborhood and the Donaldson neighborhood, respectfully. Or res it res yeah, <laughs> respectively. There we go. Um, we also have evening classes. Now we have an additional site this year that is not put up here, but if you are chosen for that site, um, you'll get the address and information. But so we have classes at Lead Southeast Preparatory Academy, uh, which is a magnet school, Glencliff High School, um, and STEM Prep Academy, uh, which is another magnet STEM school. Um, all the schools that we choose have very high concentrations of English language learners. Glencliff has over 55% of their student body as a public school that are new Americans. So very challenging. There are somewhere around 60 students at any given time who are brand new arrivals in the, into the country and know almost no English. And once you get to the high school level, it's almost impossible to catch up. So one approach that we take there is by targeting enrollment for their parents so we can get a multi-generational, you know, whole household approach to learning the English language. Um, and you can see at the bottom of the screen, let me back up real quick, that these are the levels that we offer. So we offer literacy level, which is learning letter sound recognition and how to write basic words. Intro, which is uh, the client might be able to say, Brandon, USA, <laughs> you know, or, um, I am, you know, maybe some broken phrases to get at who you are, your location, members of your family, uh, my father, Alberto, you might be able to say something like that. Um, level one is the beginner level. Um, so that is, you know, basic phrases, some writing. Um, I actually have a really good picture of each of these student abilities that we'll kind of dig into here in a little bit, but it goes all the way up to level five, which is considered advanced um, high intermediate. In addition to English classes, we have a separate program to help prepare people for the naturalization interview. Some of you all may have even been through this process or know someone who's been through this process, um, but naturalization is the process of becoming a citizen when you're not born in the United States. Um, and so we have two programs. Um, actually, they're both online right now um, because there's been a strong, um, I would say a strong preference for online learning in some of these groups. Um, and I believe we're going to have one in-person option coming soon, but right now the program is online. But this is a three-part program. One is learning the English language that you would need to have a conversation with the USCIS officer. Uh, that's United States Customs and Immigration Services. Um, that officer is allowed to ask any questions um, that follow up from the basic um, interview in order to gauge whether or not the applicant knows the English language. And if they don't, they can fail the interview. Most of our students pass the other two sections, which are one, the civics test. So there are a hundred civics questions um, that you have to be able to get right. And two, questions about your application, which is most of the time called the N-400 application for naturalization. And it's questions like um, related to answers that you gave when you submitted your application. Can you give me all the places that you lived in the last 10 years, for example, um, addresses, cities, and zip codes. Um, so we help them navigate um, not how to answer, but how to answer based on their own information, right? How to give the appropriate answer for what they said in their application. 
And we might tell them a little bit about the legal implications of their answers just to help them understand, but we don't coach them into a particular answer. So there's one on there that asks, um, like, do you have more than one wife? We can't tell them to answer no, but we can tell them that in answering no, you will become ineligible for citizenship, right? Uh, because it is against the law in the United States. So this is a fun class to teach. There is some additional training that we offer on the ground in this program, if you're interested um, in being part of this. Um, we use volunteers in this program to do mock interviews. So you sit beside a student one-on-one -on -one and walk them through questions that an interviewer might. Uh, so we will help you learn how to do that if you're interested in that program. Uh, this program, EARN, Educational Advancement for Refugees and Newcomers, is how we get adult learners to have their high school diploma equivalent or their high school equivalent, HSE. In the state of Tennessee, the uh, process for that is called the HiSET test, high school equivalency test. We will teach the reading, writing, social studies, and math that you need to um, pass the test and then basically promote students on to programs that will continue their education a little bit harder. This is actually, um, there's a new tier to this where we have a learning management system students can go through to kind of get better prepared in subject areas like science and writing that are on the test. Um, but we have been very successful in getting students ready for this test. It's a higher level audience. It's a, it's a lot more academic. They have to be able to write a five paragraph essay read some pretty intricate texts, do some higher level math, um, anything you would have to do in, in high school in the United States. So it's a tough program. Uh, some of our folks who come in with very little education stay in this program for a while. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of improvement, a lot of progress. So uh, that is another program that we offer. Uh, we do have some online classes. Now, this is outdated because these these particular levels have transitioned to in-person. Um, we are looking into how to kind of have hybrid classes. So some people in person, some people online. We're doing that in a few pilot classes, but all of our volunteer opportunities right now are in person. I will just give you, it looks like Allie changed her photo. I love that. Um, I will give you an introduction to a few people on our staff. I don't have everyone pictured here because NICE is growing so quickly. We need to go back and update some pictures. Um, there have even been some new staff members hired in the last couple of weeks, Elizabeth included. Um, but you can see me on there. It says education program manager. I'm actually now the director of education. Um, we have Allie Thomas, who is now the education program manager. Sophia Marsani, who's the data specialist. So she helps do applications for students and Fazia Muhammad. Fazia, you might see come into your classroom on a regular basis to talk to students. She's our student coordinator. She helps with things like student completion um, and referrals. So if a student wants to be a pilot and we found a pilot program for them, she might come talk to them about that program. She might also schedule them for testing. Um, we also have some lovely faces that you'll get to see around the horn. Elizabeth, I'm sure you can recognize a couple of them. Um, but at every site, there is a site coordinator. We actually have a few new site coordinators now. So even some of this information is in flux. Um, Ingrid Cruz is gonna be working at Leeds Southeast this year, but Mercedes, um, her cousin, I believe actually, um, who was our child care coordinator in the past is gonna be our site coordinator this year. So there's some shifting around of these roles as we kind of get settled into in-person for this year. Um, Shannon Ashford is the site coordinator at Glencliff. Um, high school. And then Joey here, this picture came out a little grainy. Oh no. Usually it's a little better than that. This picture I actually stole from a video where Joey was getting a Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in the community. Uh, Joey is a former ranger and works for us part-time um, as a site coordinator and citizenship specialist. Um, you guys will get to know him. He visits kind of all the sites every once in a while. So great guy. Um, and his counterpart as well, he's a morning site coordinator, I should say, at Woodmont Hills. And then Michelle Davenport is also a Tesla certified teacher working in uh, the morning time as the site coordinator at Donaldson Fellowship. So just to go into a little bit of the background here, these are the folks on the ground who are going to help you on a daily basis with things like knowing who's supposed to be in your class, what your attendance, how to log your attendance, um, what lesson you might be in. They'll help you find your teacher resources. Every site, there's a set of bins where you have dry erase markers, an eraser, little boards, um, access to backup copies of the teacher um, manuals and training documents. 
Um, they are the ones that will coordinate the community day events for your learners, and they're the ones who have final say on someone moving levels. So if someone's, for example, in Bobby's class and they want to go to Nagar's class before we actually let them transition, you have to have a conversation with the site coordinator. Site coordinator gets final say in that decision. Um, they kind of know the processes at play and know the policies and know the students. And so we kind of let, let them have that um, responsibility. Are there any questions about how we're organized? I know I just went through a lot pretty quickly. Great. And honestly, a lot of this you're going to learn experientially as you come onto the site and meet folks. Every site has two coordinators. One is the program coordinator for the site, and the other is the child care coordinator. Because in all these programs, we do offer free child care. Um, that child care coordinator can also watch your kids if you have any that you want to bring along with you. And they can get to play with all of these lovely, awesome um, kids from the population we serve. Um, I particularly love to um, hang out in that space whenever I get a chance to. Okay, so let's go on and talk about our curriculum. This is a very widespread group of people and it's impossible to serve them all the same way. So uh, our curriculum is the core of what we teach, but it's not all of what we teach. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. The program that we have is focused around Cambridge Ventures, third edition. Uh, Ventures is a whole series of, of books and workbooks for students. Um, every student gets a student book and a workbook. Um, they are leveled to align to our classes. So if you're in an intro class, you're going to have a basic workbook. If you're in a level three class, you're going to get a level three workbook. Um, and in that workbook, the whole, um, the whole idea is that you're just working through the units as you go. And there's a lot of opportunity to extend and go deeper into the material as your students need you to, but they will be successful in learning the English language if you work them, if you go, if you go through the book step by step. Uh, and I'll, I'll go over that a little more in, in, as, as we go tonight. Uh, one note about this curriculum is it is aligned to federal legislation known as the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, or WIOA. Um, WIOA is responsible for funding all of adult education. Um, WIOA is also responsible for developing um, certain standards, curriculum standards, that are important for life and work integration. So all of the topics covered in these books are not just helping you learn how to acclimate to your local environment, but they're teaching you employability skills as they go, and they're teaching you life skills that are necessary for you to understand life in the United States. Uh, there's a, a huge cultural curriculum here, and I'm going to pull a few examples to kind of explain how some of these things are integrated in the activities and allow people to learn things like grammar and mechanics while at the same time learning about local resources or fun career interests. So it is a life skills and workforce curriculum. It is broken down into 10 themes. And I love this. I actually, I'll um, wrap myself out a little bit. I was a Montessori teacher when I first started teaching. And so I'm very experiential, hands-on. Um, and I, I believe that this is a guide for what you should be teaching, but that there's always activities you can pull in and fun games you can play. And we'll talk a little bit about those opportunities too as we go. But one thing that I love about ventures is it starts with the self and works outward. And honestly, that is how human beings orient. <laughs> Understanding information about yourself comes first and then being able to extend that out into the community just happens way more fluidly, way more naturally um, than if you started with something like shopping and then moved on from there, right? It's just too abstract, right? So it goes from personal information and then expands out to information about the school in general school system, um, and then goes into things about your friends and family, personal health, and then resources around your town, time and time management. Shopping is actually a unit, so they'll learn about budgeting and how to shop. They'll learn about advertisements. They'll learn a little bit about propaganda. I mean, it doesn't call it that, but that's what it's doing, right? It's telling, kind of helping students show the determine the difference between an advertisement and something that's trying to like trick them into spending money. You know, um, there's also work, daily living, and free time. 
Now we follow this pretty much all the way through. The only thing we do differently than the book is we pull out the units shopping and free time and we put them during the summertime because there's so much fun to do in the summer. Um, and so I think you guys will enjoy that if you stick around long enough. Um, there are six lessons per unit and every lesson is a specific skill. So at the beginning, you'll have a listening lesson. In the book, in the student book and in the teacher book, there are QR codes. Students can take a picture of the QR code and it will take them straight to a recording, an audio recording, well, where, where they will hear someone telling them about a picture or an exercise and basically ask questions about that activity. Um, on site, there are also CDs. If you're um, less prone to technology and want to go that route, you can pop a CD into a, an, an audio player, um, pick the right track, it's listed in the book where you need to be, and play a recording. And someone will come on and talk to them in English. They'll hear another voice than ours, and it will ask them specific questions about the audio recording. So let me just give you, I was hoping to do this. There's a version of this that we use with our online programming called Presentation Plus. But I just want to see if you guys can see this. I might hold it up here. So, oh, let's hold on. Let me see if I can mirror my, I got all the tricks. Don't worry. Okay, so if you guys can read this, this is a unit one book, and it just says lesson A, listening. And then there's a listening activity. Um, and it, you basically click on CD one, track 10, and it will play a pre-recorded audio message. And then they go through the script, pause, it'll tell you when to pause. It asks a question, which picture matches the conversation? So it might be an argument between two people. It might be uh, someone hiring someone to do their lawn, right? So it's a picture of a person and a person with a lawnmower. They have to determine from the conversation which picture best fits the activity. As the teacher, you have um, all of the answers, but you can see it's just picture-based. So there's a few pictures, they align them to the conversation. That's what the listening looks like. There are some short answer questions in all of these, but every single um, grammar concept uh, every single language concept is its own lesson inside of the unit. So it's designed really comprehensively. Um, and there are also checks for understanding as you go. So after you do the activity, there's some follow up questions, etc. Um, that is, this is the teacher edition, by the way, each one of you will get a teacher edition book. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, we do ask for a small deposit of $35 for your teacher book. If you want to write a check, we will hold that check on to uh, on for you. And then when you return your book, we'll just we'll void the check and give it back to you. Um, if you want to give us cash, we'll hold on to that and give it back to you at the end as well. Um, if you don't have $35 and still want to teach, let me know and we will find a way to get you a book. But we don't, the big idea is we don't want to lose these <laughs> um, to teacher turnover because they do get pretty expensive. Um, inside of the book. There are instructions for teaching the lessons. However, it's a book and they're not perfect. Um, so what we've actually done, and I will show you this in a little more detail here tonight, um, is we've put a website together for all of our teachers. And in that website, there are lesson plans for every unit and every level. So you can go in and find your unit and level and find ideas for how to teach the content. Um, there are games that we play. Uh, one of them, for example, is putting vocabulary words on the board from the unit, having two students come up to the board with fly swatters, and they have to swat the word as you say it. And whoever does it quickest wins and stays up, and then you replace the slower student. Or, you know, you can just have them do it for fun, even though you don't even have to have it be a competition. They can just see how fast they can do it. Uh, but you might say like, okay, we're, today we're going to talk about different relationships. So I'm going to put the word father, mother, cousin, brother. And then I'm going to say, okay, one, two, three, brother. And they have to tap the word with a fly swatter. So there's all kinds of examples of activities like that in our lesson plan document. Um, they are for your reference. So you don't have to use our lesson plans, 
But if you're um, new to teaching or you don't have teaching experience and you just want some ideas for making it fun and exciting, and you don't want to just stand up at the front of the room and go through the activities, those lesson plans can help uh, break you out of your comfort level a little bit, give you some ideas to expand what the classroom looks like. Um, all of this book is also correlated to a standardized test called CASAS, which is the Comprehensive Adult Assessment System. Um, and essentially that is what we pre and post test our students on. So just by doing this book and working through it with your students, you are preparing them for the way they're being tested. Um, and that is a uh, test that is recognized by our, by our state government as well as the federal government. So that's one of the reasons that we use that particular curriculum. Now, um, for those of you who might have taught before, um, the term spiraling might be familiar. If you're not familiar with spiraling, spiraling is where as you go through a unit or through a book, the information might go back to something that they learned before but get increasingly more complex and more difficult. It might increase in complexity. It might increase, of, increase in level of abstraction, right? So you might be applying the same skill in a more abstract manner rather than a concrete way. Um, it's kind of subtly done, but as they work through the curriculum, it naturally gets harder for them and they naturally learn more English. Giving you a little bit more information about CASAS, um, it is used to pre-test students and determine their level. So we give two pre-tests, a reading and a listening pre-test. And after those tests, um, a student might score a 193 on one and a 197 on another. Well, we have a, a way to know that, that that score basically means they have a certain amount of abilities in the English language. We can even look down at a detail level and see what areas the student struggles with and align that to the best class for them. So we use that information to place them in their just right level. Um, it is administered by a nice staff over the computer. This year, we're gonna have two new staff members part-time. Um, we're actually hoping to hire from within the community that we serve, so former students um, that are going to be testing proctors. Those testing proctors might even pull students from your classroom some nights to give them the CASAS test. Um, and that is post-tested anywhere from 40 hours after their time in class to 100 hours after their time in class. Some students need a little more time to percolate on their English before they're ready to really take that test again. Um, at that point, the post-test score is what we compare to see if they've made growth and whether or not they're ready to advance in the program. We also consider your input as volunteer teachers. And so as people are going through your class, I want you to pay close attention to, can they participate in the discussions the same as other students? Are they doing their homework? Are they doing the lessons? Um, I did show you guys an example, and I hope to show you a, a better example, actually, of the textbook. But uh, along with the textbook is a workbook. And for every night, we do ask that you assign homework in the workbook so that students are able to work on their own. This is just independent practice. Um, a lot of the time what will happen is students come in together with someone they're really comfortable with and can hide behind. <laughs> they'll come in with someone with a little stronger ability than they have, and they'll kind of lean on them to translate or um, to support them because they may not know the language as well and it's more comfortable for them. Homework helps us to break that bond a little bit, right? Also, if you do small group activities in your classroom, mix them up a little bit. Get them away from the person that they're leaning on, right? Um, a lot of the time, um, it's really interesting, you know, you'll see older couples in particular, where one, the husband or the wife will be the one to speak for the other. And oftentimes, it's honestly the wife that knows English better than the husband or vice versa, right. Um, but what will end up happening is they will lean on each other and one of them will grow and the other won't. And so you kind of have to break them up a little bit and get them to both kind of put the work in or the other you know, the weaker partner is going to kind of lean on the stronger partner, and it's going to be harder for that person to learn the language. Um, and if you are not comfortable, like saying, hey, I just want to talk to her or something like that, you let us know that, you know, you feel like it's hard to get one person to kind of speak in a partner pair. I will come in and be like, I need you to let her into this one <laughs> and have no problem doing that. And most of the time, those couples are like completely understanding. They're like, okay, okay, I can't help her. I can't help her uh, or, or him. So, um, 
it's kind of a fun dynamic. We have um, an older Vietnamese couple that I'm just like in love with who are in our level two class. Um, it's uh, Tom uh, and his wife, um, Fung and, or Chan Fung. And I just am a, adore both of them. And um, hopefully any of you guys who end up at Glen Club will get to meet them. But uh, they have this problem all the time where Tom is the one that talks all the time and uh, Chan never gets a chance to. And then so it's like, Tom, shh. Let her do it. <laughs> Let her try. So uh, the post testing is one opportunity we have for that. The homework is one opportunity we have for that. So that's really rough look at our at our curriculum. Um, I am going to just see real quickly if I can get one more time. I'm going to try to get into presentation plus so you can get a better look at the books. Um, while I'm doing that, I just want to kind of delve in and, and probe everybody a little bit. Um, what, what things did you notice from the book itself? So I kind of went through a little bit of um, the units that are covered and how it, it um, relates back to the human experience. But does anybody have any thoughts or questions or comments about the curriculum that we use specifically? Uh, this is Lynn. What, what did you mean by workforce education? So workforce education can mean a couple of things. Um, it can mean, um, as it does with our basic English classes, um, it can mean employability soft skills that are built into a lesson. So let me give you an example of that. Um, there is a lesson in this particular book um, on time adverbs, um, before, after, um, and the way the lesson works is it teaches those particular words, but it teaches them the words in the context of a volunteer working at a nursing home. And so it's before I take the patient to get a bath, we're watching television. After they take their meds, they have to do this or that. And the, the soft exposure is to that career area. So they get an idea of what it looks like in a nursing home here in the United States. That also gives you the kind of civic engagement scale of volunteering. So it explains what a volunteer is. So you're learning about a workforce specific industry. At the same time, you're kind of learning about some civic engagement ideas or active civic participation at the same time that you're learning hard um, literacy concepts. Um, there's another part of this as well, which is that at, at the back of the book for every unit, there is a career and college readiness section. So this is the unit I'm referring to. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm sorry that I couldn't get the digital copy to work very well tonight. Um, but in this unit, it is career and college readiness, and it's all about volunteer duties. And so it discusses working in a soup kitchen, and it's got a timetable for soup kitchen duties from 5 to 5.30, you're making soup from 5.30 to 6, you're slicing bread. And so it's asking reading comprehension questions, but the content that they're reading is actually teaching employability soft skills. And by employability soft skills, I mean things like timeliness, um, hygiene, personal health. Um, I also mean things like um, being able to write a resume. So they might read resume writing. There are like personal, we don't write these anymore. We should personal memos for like, if someone calls and you missed the call, you might write a memo, like who called who and what was the message who called whom. Um, and so there's all sorts of like workforce skills kind of built into the curriculum. Okay. And it's oriented um, towards college level um, for the young people as well as um so there's a, there's a huge mix of who we have in our actual classes. A lot of our students have no interest in holding a job. The reason that we teach employability skills is they're also life integration skills, right? So being able to follow a schedule and stick to a routine are just as important in a job as they are in local integration, right? Um, and so some of the things in the book are geared towards civics and civic engagement. So there's information about voting, the census, um, parenting skills. There's just all sorts of little nuggets of integrated information. But there are college and career readiness standards also built in. And 
That's not to say it's geared toward people who are in college, but college and career readiness standards are a national curriculum. It's the same, it's actually the same curriculum as Common Core, um, but it is preparing people for college or career long term. Great. Thank you. Of course. Great questions. Sometimes the book is really spot on and easy to teach from. And sometimes you will get up in front of an audience and go to talk and you will get a befuddled look on every face because even though this is, you know, entrenched in good teaching practices and, and high quality standards, it's still a cultural curriculum. It's still culturally derived. And there are some things in this book that your students will never have seen or known about. So I'll give you an example. Um, in the around town unit, there's an activity, and I forget which level it is, um, but there's an activity where they're asked to identify the post office versus the library versus the school, okay? And they teach cardinal directions like north or to the left of, to the right of, south, east, west. Um, and um, the way that they indicate it's a library is with a book drop off. The way that they indicate that it's a school is with a school bus sitting out front. And the way that they indicate that it's the post office is with the flag and a post office box. Well, if you're not familiar with those cultural symbols and don't know the words, it might be very hard to do the assignment. So, you know, when you come to something like that and you realize that your, your students just aren't tracking with what you're saying, you know, there are some best practices that I'm going to walk you through that can help you break down that assignment. One might be that you have to read through the book ahead of time and come prepared, right? And know, I better teach what a school bus is for them to know that this is a school, you know? Um, in, in Bangladesh, I, I have a friend who was a doctor um, in Bangladesh for several years. School buses are long rickshaws that people ride you <laughs> to school on with a bicycle. They don't have a motor. They're not the big yellow things that we see driving past us. Every culture has different conceptions of some of these things. And the post office is a very American um, kind of way to do the mail. And so some of these symbols will have to be kind of pre-taught as you go. And those are just some examples. You might get in the middle of a lesson where you, you go in with best intentions and think you've done all the pre-teaching that you need and you've done what, what teachers call activating prior knowledge, which is tapping into students' natural instincts and what they know already. Um, and it just doesn't hit. And you have to back up and try again. And that is okay. <laughs> Adapting to the students that you have, adjusting to the students that you have, is something you just have to practice and try. Um, and I think you're going to find that um, it's actually kind of fun. Here are a few tips that might help you in those situations where the book just isn't hitting with the students. You're not getting the kind of reception. They're not as engaged. And you feel like they're just not following. Sometimes uh, the reason might be that they don't have the right context to follow along with you. So. Um, I'll give you a little bit of neuroscience because I am a little nerdy when it comes to this stuff. But the brain is made up of millions of connections, um, electrical synapses, where information jumps from one part of the brain to another. And these synapses naturally form cloud thoughts of information. They're called schemas. And a schema is literally just a set of interconnected pictures, words, um, memories that you might have about a certain topic. So let's just play a quick little game. Uh, I'm going to call out a word and then I'm going to call out a person and you tell me what the first thing you thought of was. This might be dangerous, so I'll try to be really careful. Uh, Bobby, what do you think of when I say school? <laughs> Sorry, I realized you were walking away as I said that. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, when I think school, just Top of my head? Yeah. Uh, education. Education. So you linked one word to another word. That's because yeah. the, the cloud of thoughts in your brain connect those things. Did you think right. of an image at that point too? Um, I did. Actually, <laughs> I thought of like a Google like clip art image of a school, like a little cartoon, <laughs> not like a real. Nice. Real yeah, school. of course. Why yeah. would you think of a building, an actual building you've been to when, when you can picture Google clip art? Uh, exactly. Yeah. My immediate thought was something unpleasant. 
What was your thought, David? Let's hear it. Unpleasant. Something oh, just different. being unpleasant, like the Bad feeling experience, of being unpleasant. Be yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's a good, that's a great point because for a lot of our, our clients, they might have some trauma in their background, like we talked about during volunteer orientation, that might trigger negative thoughts. Right? I just I hated school, especially high school. The, the happiest day of my life was when I got out of high school. I hated it, but I love college. I just hated high school. <laughs> Well, and that's another great point, which is that we don't just connect words and memories, but we also connect emotions right. um, to schemas. Right. Um, so for me, with the students, what I find, what I try to do first is to connect with them somehow and establish a rapport and see where they're coming from and what their experience is. And just to, to sort of, instead of doing going to the instruction mode immediately, just, just to have a little back and forth and that, that establish some kind of relationship. Hey, where are you guys from? You know, and just get a little, like you're talking about the schema. And if, you know, if they're all from Bangladesh or they're all from Iran or they're all from Bogota, Colombia, or, or most of them, you can have different assessments of which direction you're going in. So, and, and then you can proceed to what you're teaching. Yeah, and it's so it's so neat to get to know the cultural groups of the students that you're working with because yeah. you kind of it helps you inform your teaching, but it yeah. also helps you know what they're going to connect with, um, yeah. and that can help you kind of teach better to the students in the room. Um, I bring this up because schemas are almost impossible for adults to form. Um, forming a new schema after the age of twenty five is is very very difficult. Um, so what we have to do as educators is not form new schemas, but find ways to connect to existing schemas. Because if we can make of a, uh, if we can have a student think of something that they already have a schema built around, a set of images, a set of ideas, a set of emotions around, then we can tie a new concept into that schema, and they're far more likely to retain it to their long-term memory. So, for example, um, if my first thought as someone from, uh, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I, I was originally born in New York, right? So if you want to talk about apple trees, I'm going to think about, you know, the area in New York where I grew up, right? Where there's just these massive groves of, of apple orchards. I could find a way to tap into that schema if I know the student's background, get to know them a little bit. Right. Um, and if that's the case, I can then rephrase or paraphrase what I've been saying. You know, so if I'm teaching a concept and it's not hitting, changing my language might help me to tie into that schema or find a way to connect the information to the student differently. So sometimes backing up and saying things in a different way is really helpful. Um, another thing is that students don't necessarily catch on to things verbally. Sometimes you have to use what's written down and change the language there too. Um, sometimes when they're reading the book, they might misunderstand and get stuck on a word or a series of words, and you might just have to like unpack it with them a little bit. Uh, this happened to me today, actually. Um, there was a student on a test who was stuck on a concept, and it wasn't even, it was, the question was kind of designed to throw them off a little bit. It's a higher level student, and rather than read the whole question, they were focused on this one thing and kept answering the question wrong, and it wouldn't let them move forward. Um, and so that happens too, and you kind of have to help guide them through the story of the book and guide them through like the narrative of what they're learning. One way to do that as well that you'll see here is asking guiding questions. Ooh, I thought I was going to be able to highlight, but I can't. Asking guiding questions. So if I was to say, um, you know, we, let's say we were back in that lesson where they're having to identify the library versus the post office versus the school, right? And I said the word school, all of a sudden they're thinking of all of these disparate ideas and their connection to school, right? And some of them may be thinking about discomfort. Some of them might be thinking about a, a clip art picture. Some of them might be thinking about the school they grew up in, right? Um, but we have to try to find a way to connect to all of those ideas all at once. And, and so, um, you know, one way we could do that is by asking some guiding questions. What do you see? What are you thinking about when I say school? Uh, what is this? What is this picture of? You know, if it's the bus, you know, what is a bus for? How do your kids get to school? Have you seen the school bus that way? Try to connect to an experience they might have from their daily life. Um, asking a guiding question might even be, 
um, when you're listening to a story, you know, an audio clip of two people talking, what was the person asking for? Or what was the conversation about? Help them kind of unpack it with you um, might be able, might, might be a way to kind of get unstuck in certain situations. And then um, another thing that you might do is also tap into students who understand the concept and help them relate it back to students who don't. So use student mentors. Um, and again, like tying into schemas might mean thinking of creative ways to talk about a subject area. So, you know, trying to find, getting to know your students might also teach you their strengths and weaknesses. And you might know a little bit about the background and want to try to tap into their memory, their prior knowledge that way. Here are some things that I want you guys to keep in mind. And, and you know, I always say that to go through this process, you don't have to have any teaching experience. I'm using some high level teaching words, but I think it's important for you guys to get to know those. Uh, terms. It's not something that I expect you to be an expert at after this, right? You could spend your whole life studying this stuff as I have and not be very good at it <laughs> still. Um, but here's some things to keep in mind when you're teaching. We've said this a couple of times a couple of different ways. Get to know your students. Um, building those relationships is really going to help you be able to unlock their connection to the information. I can't say this one enough. Use visual supports. So if you're teaching about a school and it asks you to find the bus, come in with a cutout of a bus and put it on the board or draw one on the board or find a picture and put it on your computer, right? Um, the rooms do have whiteboards, but you know we can lend you guys laptops too. If you have a laptop, you can bring it in and pull some pictures up. If you want us to print out pictures of things, we're, we're more than happy to do that. Um, but visuals are really helpful. Model tasks before you ask your learners to try them. So I always teach a five part lesson plan. The first part being welcome to the class. Here's what we're doing today. Kind of activate prior knowledge. Can you think of a time when you were in school? What was it like? What was it like when you went to school? And have people talk about it, right? And then the, the meat of the lesson is model, whole group practice, individual practice. Um, so modeling, sometimes in teaching, we call this the I do, the we do, and the you do. So I do is when I practice the skill. So I might listen to an audio clip and then explain my thinking. You know, in that conversation, I heard two people talking about mowing the lawn. Let's look and see, when you mow the lawn, what do you use to mow the lawn? Maybe one of these pictures has a lawn care item. And then I would go through the picture left to right and say, look at this picture. There's nothing in this picture that would deal with long car. Let's go to the next picture and really <laughs> model it for them. Um, the slower, the more intentional, the more dragged out, the better it's going to hit. Um, you know, we have a lot of volunteers who wonder like, should like, am I going to be really boring if I go too slow? Am I going to lose people if I go too slow? With this particular group, the slower, the better unless they tell you otherwise. Some of your higher level groups might be able to move a little quicker, but in general, your groups are gonna wanna go slow. They're gonna wanna take it slow. And they like to take the same class over and over again because they really like to practice. Um, so going slow is helpful too. Can anybody else think of um, an example of when, uh, of a task you might model for a student based on what we talked about so far? or from your own experience? When, how would you model something for a student? I, I like to ask them to kind of relate it to their personal experience when I talk to them. So kind of when they relate it to their own personal experience, they find some words that they can use and it stays in their mind better, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I had a student this morning, we had a lesson and I asked her, just look at the picture before we go into the material and tell me what you think is going on there without any other idea. Just, just overall, what do you think is going on? And there was a silence and she's got the means and she said, I don't know. And I said, that's great. That's great. Well, let's, let's look at it again. 
So we look at the picture and I say, let's look at the first question. The first question is saying, uh, John is at the desk. John is at the desk. So let's, let's look at where the desk is. So I try and go back and I'll, I'll, I'll walk through the first question myself. Then the second one, I'll start it and help her through it and assist her along the way and with the aim of, on the third question, her doing it herself, if, if possible. And if not, just going back and circling back to the beginning and starting all over again. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's so important to kind of go slow and intentional, go back and ask the same question multiple times um, and talk about your thinking. So if I ask a question, what is the person doing in the picture? Yeah. I want to answer that question first, look at a picture and do it myself. And I'm not going to just say, oh, they're reading a book. I'm going to think out loud. I see that they're sitting in a chair, holding something. It's open. They have their glasses on. This looks like they're reading a book. Yeah, that's what I wanted to hear, something like that or something, some verbalization of something. But she was completely baffled by it, <laughs> which was good. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly right. And, and part of it is... Um, you know, especially if our students come in, like some of them do, without formal education, they've never been required to talk about their thinking. They've never been allowed, uh, required to say, okay, let me take my thoughts and actually explain what I'm thinking. And so that's a really hard, in, in teacher terms, you call that metacognition. Some of you probably already know that already. Um, thinking about your thinking, talking through your thinking. It's a very difficult skill, especially in certain cultural groups where that's just not how education's done, where they're from. Right. Um, and so it can be a little uncomfortable, but it's important to show and model before you want a student to do that. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, this is going to be a good uh, check for understanding on from me to you. <laughs> okay. What, was there a time this summer where you had to model a skill for students in the summer camp for them to really be able to practice it on their own? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, let's see, probably tons of times when you're trying to think of a specific example. Um, the population we were working with um, for Context for Everyone, a lot of them were uh, up to 14 years old and uh, could not really spell anything except their own name um, and sometimes not even their last name. Um, let's see. Trying to think of modeling specific skills, though. Uh, hmm. Uh, there was a lot of sounding out of phonic sounds. It's very different. Um, That's a great example, though. So if if you put an A on the board and you go A ah ah apple, you're modeling how to read that letter. When you spell a word for a student, you're modeling how to spell that word. Um, so, I mean, we do this very instinctually and might not even recognize that we're doing it. So that's great. I'm also challenging you to think of future examples for when you do this training. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's go to the next one. Foster a safe class environment. Can anyone think of how we might foster safety in the classroom or why we might foster safety in the classroom? I mean, first thing that it came to my mind, because as I said, I was a uh, English language learner. So I always wanted to be in a classroom that who, where I can feel safe and not be shy to talk because I know many students, they're afraid of speaking at all because they, they know they can't speak or they're, they're struggling that maybe grammatically they're wrong. So they hesitate to, express themselves, talk, say anything. If you could provide the safe environment for them that we all were here to learn. So there is no, there is no, nothing wrong with you if you say something wrong, it's totally fine. So we all wanna talk and learn. So they should be, they should feel very comfortable about making mistakes because this is where we are here for. That's exactly right. There's a certain comfort in knowing we're all going through this together. We're learning together. Um, everyone in this class is here for a reason. Um, one of the biggest things that you're doing at that point is you're encouraging what we call risk taking. You're encouraging vulnerability. So 
people are more willing to try and answer a question. They're more willing to give it a shot if they feel safe and comfortable doing so. It's part of that bond, right? So if I said, I want you to try to read this word out loud, and you thought that I was going to wrap your knuckles with a ruler, you're not going to try because you're afraid you're going to get it wrong. But if you encourage a safe classroom environment where mistakes are allowed and a necessary part of the learning process, and mistakes are encouraged because we're all learning together, people are going to be more likely to speak up and try. Right. And the more they try, the more they're going to get it right. Yeah. I mean, one more thing. I'm sorry. No, uh, please. Go ahead. Woman and girl. And you've been working in this environment for many years. So you, you probably, you know better than me, but I grow up as a woman in a Muslim country and, you know, it's very hard, especially for girls or women to speak out or actually say, because they're even, they have less self-confidence to talk and to express their idea or opinion because they never allowed to do that. So this is something that I really, really want to work on to encourage them to say something, start telling what they think, their opinion, their ideas, and probably they need even more encouragement because they, they're not used to it. They've never been in a place that they're actually allowed to talk and say. That is, that is so true. And it's definitely part of our shared experience at NICE. And I'll say it, it takes a special degree of tact and courtesy um, to kindly let someone know, I want to hear from your wife, or I want to hear from your daughter, or I want to hear from this particular woman in the classroom because they're often quiet. And and a lot of that is culturally reinforced, like you're saying. And that's not to say that the cultural context is negative, but it is a barrier for learning the language that we have to be aware of. And it takes a little bit of effort and courtesy to say, you know, Bobby, you did a great job, but I actually wanna hear Lynn try this one on her own this time, right? Um, and And if you do it well, you know, you don't offer offense, you reinforce again, that safe classroom environment for everyone. Zinia, I saw you had you had your hand up. Did you have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say exactly what uh, Nigar. How do you say your name? Did I say that correctly? Nigar. Nigar. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, when I worked in uh, in a university setting, and I had a group of um, it, it was a lot of students coming in from Saudi Arabia, and all the men were. Uh, taking university classes, and all of their wives were taking English classes, and it was a mixed group, and then I had some, like, Chinese students, some Korean students, and then uh, some men from Iran, actually, and so I, I quickly learned that you have to be sensitive to just gender and cultural context in general, because people will respond differently, and that's okay, and it doesn't mean that they're not excited to learn, uh, they just have to be encouraged. Yeah, those little encouragements that we can offer are huge, yeah. for sure. Thank you for saying that, Zinya. And if you're not sure, if you ever do have someone who's really quiet and you're not sure how to break them out of their shell, or you're not sure how to get them into a situation where they do feel comfortable, ask your site coordinator. That's your first resource. Ask your site coordinator. They might know the family. They might know the context. They might feel willing enough to go up to the, the person holding them back, because often there is someone holding them back, and say, <laughs> in a way that because they have a relationship, because they know the family, because they've been there consistently in their lives, everyone responds to positively, right? Um, we might even um, be able to just talk to someone privately and say, we know you're excited to both learn English, but for it to work, we're going to have to hear from both of you. And, and we know how to have those conversations in a really caring way. Um, so if you do get stuck and you have somebody who's just not opening up because you feel like someone in their family is holding them back, or um, sometimes it could be a neighbor, but mostly it's a family member that does that. And it's a protection thing. They want to be the one to get it right and kind of help along. And they think by talking for someone, they can help them. And it actually ends up creating that, that hold back. Um, if that does happen, just let us know. Yeah, for sure. Um it says on the screen here, watch your teacher talk and your writing. I'm going to amend that to say, watch what you say. And, and what I mean by that is try to use vocabulary that's consistent to the book. 
because the book says things in a way that the student should be able to understand based on their literacy level. Um, and if you ever notice that students aren't tracking, you might try to change the way you're saying things to be a little simpler or more broken down. And don't be afraid to repeat yourself um, because repetition is really important. Another part of this too, and I hate to say that I even have to say this because it seems intuitive, but it happens all the time. I've, I'm guilty too. If you go up to the whiteboard and you're writing something and you're talking turned away from the students, they are not gonna follow what you're saying, right? Because you, they're not able to see your mouth, they're not able to see your face. So when you are talking, watch your body language too. Where are you situated? Where are you looking? Where's your body kind of angled? Make sure that you turn and talk to your students or get them in small groups and talk to them and that you're not talking at a board where the students can't hear you very well because they will get lost. It's okay if it happens, you know, but if you do feel like, okay, I'm a little turned around here, just try to remind yourself, okay, where am I facing? Who do I see? Can I see the faces of my students? Am I with them in what I'm saying? And if you need to write and slow it down and then say what you're going to say, reading it and then hearing it is way better than reading it and hearing it. Because sometimes they'll be so focused on reading it that they won't hear what you said and they won't understand what you said. Um, use scaffolding. Uh, what that means basically, and the book does this naturally, so you don't necessarily have to know how to do this on your own, but uh, an instructional technique that we use is bringing back older information, like we said before, but going deeper with it. This says bring authentic materials to the classroom. You might not be able to bring a whole bus into the classroom with you, <laughs> but you might be able to bring a picture of a bus. Um, if you're talking about um, family and you're talking about relationships, you might bring a picture of your own brother or sister or mom um, and say, this is my mother, you know? Um, that really helps make that connection. Again, one of the biggest problems that um, new teachers make is they try to go too fast. Um, it's, I'm gonna do the activity. Let's go one, two, three, four. And you get the work done and you get some people answering the questions, but sometimes what happens is you overload that learning process. So um, we've broken it down to where each lesson should take one day. You're gonna start in lesson one, unit A, at the very beginning of the book. Not all our volunteers get that opportunity. We restart the book in August of every year. So you're coming in at the perfect time and you'll just go through lesson A one night and then lesson B until you've finished the whole unit. We do have a pacing guide. And if you find yourself getting ahead, you're probably going too fast and might want to slow down and go back over some of the things you've already covered. There are also unit tests in here. So at least one of the sessions each unit is to go through the test. The test shouldn't take the whole class. So you might want to go ahead and go over the test answers once you've collected the student work and just see how everybody did and, and help them get through um, some of those things. One of the hardest skills for new teachers, myself included, I struggled with this for a while, um, is balance in the way you teach the class because students thrive in routine. They love it when you are consistent with the way you order your classroom and what kinds of things you cover in each category so that you have the same. I used to be notorious for, I would say this, I would open class the same day with the same phrases. I would capture the student's attention with the same phrases and be very routinized. But if you're too routine oriented, what ends up happening is you lose your students because they get a little bored or they get comfortable, right? And you, it's, teaching is a thing where you have to constantly keep everyone on their toes, keep the brain buzzing. You have to keep the left and right hemisphere talking to each other. And so you have to get them to stand up and sit back down or move around. Movement is huge for that communication between left and right brain. Um, breaking up the routine with a little bit of variety catches people off their toes and challenges whether or not they really know what they think they do. And it's a huge technique. So if it was all variety all the time, it would be chaos. If it was all routine all the time, you wouldn't be able to really synthesize what you were understanding. You wouldn't know it for sure. And so finding a balance of bringing in something new every once in a while and adding some variety to what you're teaching and how you're teaching it, but following a clear routine is a fine line to walk and finding that balance might take you a lifetime, but I just give you the advice that it's worth trying. 
give me one second, guys. I um, started this when there was still daylight, and now there's not. The light switch is on the other side of the room. I'm going to go turn it on real quick. That's a little better. So um, all of these might seem a little daunting, especially if you've never taught before. Some of them might seem super excited and you just want to know more. Um, we do have a website for our nice adult education team. I'm going to show it to you here in just a second. You're also going to get it sent out to you after this training as a follow-up so you can go through it on your own. At that website, no worries, Bobby. I'll make sure to share the recording afterwards. Thank you for letting us know. Um, great to have you with us tonight. Um, at the website, you'll find the syllabus, lesson plan templates, the calendar, information about all of our programs. So if I'm a volunteer at Woodmont Hills, I can go and find my site and it will show me a picture of the door I go through at the site so I know exactly where to be to meet my site coordinator. It also has something that we call reports, lesson plan reports. This is super important. This is unique to our program. So in our program, you're going to teach one day a week and someone else is going to teach the other day of the week. So you might teach on Tuesday, but there's also going to be someone teaching your class on Thursday. And it's important for you to stay in touch with that person so you know what they taught and they know what you taught. Um, there is kind of a nice balance there. That is also a person that if you have to be out for the night, you might reach out to your counterpart and say, hey, do you mind switching this week? And see if they'll cover your class for you. Um, if they can't cover your class, that's when you would let your site coordinator know and they'll try to find a substitute for you. If they can't find a substitute, that's when they'll let Allie know and we'll get it taken care of from there. But your, your co-teacher is an important counterpart. So I'm going to change my little thing here and go into the website. Can you guys still see this okay? Perfect. So program information is where you'll go to see the sites. It will show you where to go to each site, like what doors to enter, the building, the location. We'll send this to you ahead of time, Elizabeth, when you make a placement, you'll always send the site, the address, the day of the week, the day they're supposed to site to, to start, um, what time the program meets, all that information is here. So we'll also share the website so you have this for a frame of reference. One thing that's on the website as well is track it forward. Track it forward, if you remember, is how we monitor volunteer hours. So after every time that you volunteer, we ask that you log your hours here. You're going to hit log hours. There is also a phone app. If you prefer to use the phone app, we can get you set up that way. But it will look something like this. You'll put the number of hours you worked to on the day you worked. And for the activity, you all are going to put English teacher. And then just submit your time. That way, we have a record. Um, of all your volunteer hours. And it's really important that we get everyone's hours, even if you don't need to track them, because we might be able to use them for some of our purposes as well. Um, the calendar, if you go to the calendar, it's going to show you all the events coming up. It's going to show you when we start classes, um, the fall session, when there's a break. So we follow Metro Nashville Public School Systems calendar. So if there is a fall break at school, there's a fall break at NICE. Um, so you'll see that as well. You'll also see things like when citizenship class begins, um, pre and post testing for new students, new sessions. Um, so session one, by the way, in fall is units one and two, and then three and four, and so on and so forth. If you go over here to adult education program, adult education program, there's lots of drop down options. If you are teaching high set citizenship or you're a child care volunteer, you might open one of these. But if you're teaching an ESL class like most of you all are, you'll just expand this arrow here and you'll find the syllabus, lesson plans, and audio files. If you remember me saying you can have a CD on site, we've also digitized all of the recordings for you. So if, you, if the QR code doesn't work and you get stuck, you can go to the website, pull an audio file, find your level, 
and be able to find your unit. So unit one, here's all the audio files. I'm going to share my audio because I forgot these are in here. You can hear an example of an audio clip. Unit two, test. Section A, listening. I hope you hear an example. One. Unit two, test. Let me see if I can find another one, because that is the test. Might have to work on these to make sure they're working, but it should work. You might have to, let me try downloading it first. See if that makes a difference. We'll let that download for a second. I'll come back. Unit 10, test. Section A, listening. One. Swimming? Swimming? That's nice. I wonder if they change their audio recordings. That's all right. We'll make sure those are up to date for you guys. I'll let the team know that they weren't working. Um, another thing that you can find here. So again, adult education program, general ESL audio files and workbooks, lesson plans. You can find lesson plans and lesson plan reports. So let's go back and let's do the first one. If you click general ESL, it will pull up a separate page with all those drawdowns as well. Syllabus for all lessons. So you can find session one general syllabus and you'll find what you're supposed to teach each day. So the community day for the first lesson is always on SMART goals. We help our students with their, their lifelong goals. The first day of class is generally a welcome. I get to know you, get to know your students. Where are you from? Hi, my name is Brandon. I am from New York. What is your name? Where are you from? Just get to know them a little bit. Um, and then by the second week, you're getting into unit one, lesson A, and so on and so forth. By the end of the unit, you'll have covered lesson one and or unit one and two, and be able to do both of the tests for those units. We build in, by the way, um, we build in vacation days and things like that to the syllabus. We'll make sure that you guys get copies of all of this from Miss Allie Thomas, who's the program manager in adult education. Um, we'll make sure that you have access to up-to-date syllabi, up-to-date lesson plans and the like. Let me give an example again of a lesson plan. So, um, let's say you're teaching in level one. The lesson plan is going to be written out like this. It's going to have a warm up, a review, an introduction, and some new material for you to cover. They'll give you a comprehension check, some practice, an application session, and the whole thing will take the whole class period. So just to give you an idea, what does this look like? Presentation of new material. This is the modeling phase that I do. On page 32, take, it the, take a look at the words on the top of the page. Point to the mother point to the father. Make sure students can pronounce each word. So there's directions here and how to do some of this. You can also look at the comprehension check. So you might ask a student or point to someone in the text named Carlos. Is Carlos the daughter? Is Louise the daughter? Who is the daughter? Who is the daughter is a higher level question, right? Um, then is Carlos the daughter? So we've done some of this for you in the warm up. Uh, families and friends, what is a family? Take a picture of a family. Um, ask students to call out words they know about family members. So we've given you a couple of ideas um, in these lesson plans that you can use. Now, again, these lesson plans are for you to use if you would like, they're not required. It's just a jumping off point. Let's say that I am teaching at Glencliff High School and I'm the level one teacher. If I hit Glencliff High School, Again, I did adult education program, general ESL, lesson plans and reports, 
Glen Cliff High School. If you get lost and can't find this, let me know. I can help you with it. This is built out from Google Sites and we absolutely hate the navigating. So we're doing the best we can with the free resource. Um, I believe the team is actually redesigning this website as I speak, which would be great because um, it is a little clunky. Um, but for level one, you'll come up to the book here, level one. So this is Glencliff. If I'm level one, it says intro, level one, level two, level three, level four, I'll find the level one tab and I'll find the unit that I taught. So let's say I just did listening part A. I would put my name in as the person teaching. I would give my contact information. Some of this could just be copied and pasted over from the other time. Why would I put my contact info in? Does anybody, can anybody think of why that might be important here? In case they have a question about what you did or didn't do. Yeah, exactly. So that your co-teacher can ask you any questions. If they come upon this and they're like, I don't understand what you wrote here. Make sure they know how to get in touch with you. Over time, because you're working with this person for nine weeks, they're teaching another day of the week. You might not see them very often, but you get to know them really well. And we have people who become lifelong friends just from volunteering together in this kind of capacity. You'll get to know each other and talk really regularly. You'll enter the day you taught the subject area, and then you'll just describe your lesson and what homework you assigned. So for this one, it's, I started class with an icebreaker and some introductions. I did not work on any lesson in the book. Did not assign homework. Um, but you might say, okay, I assigned page 72 through 74 for homework on one day. You know, just depends what your um, students get used to. There's also a place to write comments. This is a great opportunity to share notes about the students with us and with your co-teacher. These students are advanced for level one. This person should be in level two. Um, started the first exercise, but did not complete. Lesson not completed. Those kind of comments are helpful for your co-teacher to know. Um, so each site will have their own link here. Each level will get their own page. And if you expand it, it will take you to the sheet. If you can't see right now, this is view only. If you can't get in to edit, uh, you can request access and we will give it to you. But hopefully um, we're able to give everybody the right permissions before you start. Sometimes we're a little backlogged, especially right now with our transition. So if the first time you go in and need permissions, what will happen is it will message us and we will give you access to the document. Any questions about how to report your lesson to your co-teacher? Great. One of the more tedious parts of the program. And again, we don't expect you to learn this overnight. So if you have questions ongoingly, just let us know. There's also a page on the website where you can just find additional teacher um, resources, additional websites, some frequently asked questions, extra practice, online resources, Etc. So feel free to explore this on your own. I'm not going to go through all of it tonight. Um, it's not mandatory. It's just if you want to know more. Um, lesson plan reporting. We do ask that you write about your lesson plan within 24 hours of teaching. So we know you might not be able to do it right after you volunteer. Um, but if you end class a few minutes early, go ahead and write what you did. Um, doesn't have to be a narrative, just enough for the next person to know what they should be teaching, right? And the reason that we do 24 hours is so that the other person has time to prepare their lesson. So if you're a Tuesday teacher, this is particularly important. And then know what the other person is teaching. So communicate with the co-teacher, know what they're teaching. So how long do you have to log your lesson plan report? When should it be submitted? How many hours after you teach? Nagar, do you know how many hours does it have to be within how many hours should you log your report? Uh, maybe 12 hours, just guessing. The, the most you should go is 24 hours, so by the next day. Mm -hmm. So um, and this is online. That is not true, so ignore that. We just have to go back and update this particular. But I have another version of this, actually. Hold on one second. Oh, this pesky bar. Let me see what this one says. 
Ah, here we go. So what does the commitment look like that we're asking from for you guys? Uh, we do ask that you teach for a minimum of nine weeks. If you have to be absent during any of that time, let us know in advance if you can. If you get sick, it's understandable. If you can't come because you get busy or something like that, that's perfectly okay. You can let your co-teacher know to see if they can sub for you and if they can't let your site coordinator know. Um, we do ask that you teach one class a week for two hours that you prepare lessons. So teaching is not an easy commitment. You know, you're gonna spend some time getting ready for class. We recommend you spend about an hour, at least half an hour getting your lesson ready. Um, the difference between being well-prepared and coming in on the fly can often mean the difference between your students understanding your lesson and following along. Um, and I will tell you as someone who's gone into a lesson and prepared, they will notice <laughs> that you're unprepared and you will lose some of that really important trust that they have in you. Um, they will never tell you because to our students, teachers are the salt of the earth. They act like their teacher is the most important person in the whole world um, because you guide them through one of the most important skills they're trying to, to learn right now, which is the language of their new country. Okay, uh, we do ask that you fill out and submit lesson plans like I showed you. We ask that you give out the unit tests. Your site coordinator will remind you about this. They'll help you print them out so you're not doing this on your own and it's in the syllabus. It is also in the book. So if, the, if you go through the book and hit the unit test, you know it's about time to have those printed off and handed out. Each of the sites has their own printer, so your site coordinator should be printing that out for you. Um, but you might wanna check to make sure the day of that you have the materials that you need. Part of this is just getting to know your site coordinators and your co-teachers. Um, if you're teaching the day after a unit test, you might wanna find out that it was given to make sure. Um, we also ask that if you stick around for longer than nine weeks, um, which most of you guys will do because you're all incredible and you're gonna love it here, um, we have follow-up trainings. And those trainings go even deeper into activities you can do and games and grow your teacher toolkit. Um, if you're gonna stick around for longer than nine, nine weeks or even for the year, we ask that you attend three out of four quarterly teaching workshops so you can be an ongoingly better teacher. Um, that is not a requirement. It's really a recommendation, but it's a really great idea because some of these workshops, Elizabeth, you're going to help organize them, but the whole team is going to contribute to them. They're a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun. Um, we play games. We kind of goof off. There's usually food and you just learn how to be a better teacher. Um, there is opportunities to observe a training or to be observed. Um, but we'll talk about those kind of as they come up. Um, usually when we do this teacher training, we do it on site and you get to watch teachers teach. But right now we're out of session and with the pandemic, we're kind of making sure we're a little responsible. So what I'm going to do so you get to do an observation is I'm going to send you recordings of our morning classes that we've been doing since the pandemic. So you can see what some of our teachers do for their classrooms. It's a little different since it's not in person, but it should give you a really strong idea. And Elizabeth will probably pull from a middle class, like level two, and just pick a day where there's something fun going on. We can go through the recordings together and share that out with everybody afterwards. Keep absences to a minimum, just like we talked about last time. We are therapeutic relationships for our students. These students are, have been through a lot. They're learning something that's highly emotional for them. Um, the more you're out, the less you get to bond with the student, the less they're going to connect to you, the harder it's going to be to teach them. Um, not only that, but it's going to be harder for all of us, <laughs> and, and especially if you don't have lessons prepared ahead of time. Um, I don't mind jumping in subbing sight unseen because I've done this a lot for a long time, but not everybody feels that way. Few things, we're almost to the end here. Uh, policies and procedures. Classes do not meet during federal holidays. And like I said earlier, we follow the school system schedule. So we do have programming during summer. So that is an exception. But if there's a snow day and school is closed, we also have to close. Um, if there is a um, federal holiday and the school is closed, we have to close. We do ask for a $35 refundable deposit for your book. That's just so we don't have them all walk away at once and lose out on the hundreds of dollars that would cost us, if not thousands. We have a lot of teacher books. Um, 
it is $35. You can write a check. That check again will be returned to you at the end of the program. Or if you give us cash to hold on to, we will clip it to a file, put it in a lockbox, and give it back to you at the end. There are on site copies of the student books, teacher editions, and CDs. Each one of you will not just get your teacher book, but you'll also get a student book and workbook so you can see what the students see. Your book is going to have the, uh, the answers filled out. Theirs will not. So you'll get to see the differences. Um, there is attendance to be taken, but I'll tell you something. We're in a really unique position. Um, one of our largest donors to this program, funders of this program, is the State of Tennessee Department of Workforce Development. That is because in Tennessee, um, adult education is situated inside the Labor Department. It's a very unique and politicized situation indeed. Um, but we have still not gotten confirmation on how to take attendance since the pandemic is kind of um, allowing us to go back to in-person services, hopefully long-term. We've been doing it online. We used to have the students physically sign something. I'm not sure exactly what attendance will look like, but there will be a way that your site coordinator will go over with you that you have to take attendance. Students have to, to sign in and out of class and they have to be registered in the class before they can take it. So if someone shows up, like Elizabeth comes into my class and I don't see on her, her on the roster, I would wanna ask my site coordinator and say, hey, do you know if Elizabeth is in my class? Cause they might be in the wrong level. And if the site coordinator is not sure and you're not sure, you can let them sit for the class rather than asking them to leave. We wouldn't do that. Um, but you need to let them know they need to fill out an application and come to a registration before they can take the class. And then basically what we'll do if they haven't done those things is we'll put them on a wait list and enroll them in the next session. Because we do what's called managed enrollment. There are registration three times every nine weeks, one at each location. Really it's five if you look at our whole program. Um, new students will be added to the roster at the beginning of each session. So you, you shouldn't have a lot of people joining your class midterm. It does happen sometimes because a student might go up a level and realize like, I'm not really ready. I want to go back to my old class and they might join your class a little late. Um, but it's, it's rare and no one is allowed to, there's a two week drop ad period. So no one's allowed to join the class week three or later. Um, that should be the case. There might be cer certain special circumstances that get made because we're, I would say, a very accommodating group of people. Um, but hopefully, um, we try to keep a very consistent group of students for you all on that. You should have the same students from week two moving forward. We talked about lesson plan reporting. I'll say it one more time. Be detailed in your lesson plan report. You don't need a narrative, just enough for the next person to come in and teach after you. We do ask that they are submitted 24 hours after the class session and the link is provided here. We will also share this PowerPoint with you. Again, we ask that you administer unit tests. It says incorporate alternative assessments. And by that, we mean what we might call checks for understanding. Some people call them exit tickets. It might be something like, here's a demonstration. Nagar, how many hours do you have to submit your reports? I will do a dry drop and finish my class, so I won't forget it. <laughs> so <laughs> I know asking, I have one day. <laughs> asking questions like that is a way to do a soft assessment, right? Um, okay, great. Awesome. So what will happen next? Elizabeth is going to go through all of your background checks and make sure that you've all passed. We'll let you know. We will also give you the opportunity to shadow a teacher. The way we're gonna do that is by sharing a link to a recording this time, since we don't have current in-person classes. You will then be assigned a school and level assignment. Most of you all are already in a tracking document where we think you're gonna land. So we'll say, hey, does this site and time work for you? And you let us know. Um, your names are in this document with a question mark. Once we know from you that you're gonna be there, we'll put you as confirmed, collect that book deposit, and you'll pick your books up from Allie Thomas, the program manager for adult education. And you can do that at 417 Welshwood, which is our um, office complex. We will give you that information when you come to schedule picking your book up. Otherwise, classes begin next Tuesday. So Tuesday or Thursday of next week is when you will start your class. We'll try to have your levels to you by Thursday so you can be prepared. Um, if not tomorrow, we're going to work on that. Um, 
but that way you can pick your book up the night of class if you can't get it beforehand. Because remember, your first day is getting to know the students. Okay, that's all I have for you guys this evening. Finished a few minutes early, but relatively on time. Does anybody have any other questions? I'm going to stop the recording in case anybody.